in a rush of slaughter, ravaged our holy shrines and sanctuaries. As demons from the place of torments, they compelled our Holy Father to surrender the precious metals wherein lay the holy bones of Saint Columba. Walls of axes fell around us, slaughtering 68 of our blessed men, torching the scriptorium, leaving our sacred books to burn in the flames of hell. In 806, the monastery of Iona suffered its worst and most savage attack. The very next year, the annals recalled the building in Ireland of a new monastery of Columba at Kells. While the community remained on Iona for many, many years, the leadership of the Columban family of monasteries was ultimately transferred to Ireland. The decoration of the Book of Kells was never completed. Certain major pages were planned but not executed, while the decoration of other pages was left incomplete or altered. It is not known why this should have been. The most dramatic explanation involves a scenario of monks fleeing Iona in a curra in fear of their lives, clutching their great unfinished gospel book, while Vikings plundered and looted behind them. But what we do know is that it was at Kells that the first reference to the great gospel book of St. Colin Kill occurs. When did it come to Trinity? It came to Trinity sometime after 1661. At that stage the monastery in Kells was falling into, into ruin and was actually threatened by the soldiers of Cromwell. And the Bishop of Meath, Henry Jones, thought it would be safer to bring it to Dublin and it came to Trinity just after that. So Trinity College has been looking af after it since uh, the late 17th century. Thanks to that great herd of philosophers, of travelling Irish men of learning who flocked to the mainland of Europe, many Irish Gospels and other books survive in libraries on the continent. The most remarkable collection is held in this beautiful monastic library of St. Gaul in Switzerland, named after the saint who accompanied the mission of St. Columbanus. In the beginning of the 7th century, an Irish monk, probably from Bangor, arrived here. His name was Gullus, and he was on its way to Italy and decided to stay in the former wilderness of St. Gaul and settled here. Around a hundred years later, his grave became a holy center and more and more monks arrived here from Ireland. Some of them brought with them their manuscripts, books, Bibles, and so that was the beginning of book collection, which became one of the most important center for knowledge in Western Europe. The earliest library catalogue mentions Libri Scotici, that means Irish manuscripts written around 750, so they are indeed older than the Book of Kells, and they count among the most famous and most beautiful Irish manuscripts. Sometimes Irish scholars or Celtists who want to study Irish manuscripts have not to go to Trinity College, but to St. Gallen in Switzerland. For over 300 years, the Book of Kells was displayed here in the long room of Trinity College Dublin, where a page was turned every day. To see all of the book's 680 pages, two pages at a time, would have taken over a year of daily visits. One of the visitors who never forgot the experience was the young James Joyce. The incomparable calligraphy of the early Irish monks may have inspired Joyce to invent denser and denser rushes of verbal pyrotechnics in his last masterpiece of wordsmithery, Finnegan's Wake, a book he hoped would represent, at one and the same time, an image of the universe and a work for an ideal reader affected by an ideal insomnia. For Joyce, the Book of Kells was something of a doomsday book, with lines of litter slittering up and louds of latter slittering down. 
Finnegan's Wake is studded with references to the Book of Kells and to Columba, or Column Killer, which he contorts in the famous Tunk page to Column Killer. Scraped away, plainly inspiring the tenebrous Tunk page of the Book of Kells, and then need it not be lost sight of that there are exactly three squads of candidates for the Crucian Rose awaiting their turn in the marginal panels of Column Killer chugged in their three ballot boxes, then set apart for such hanging committees where two was enough for anyone. Starting with old Matthew himself. Perhaps the greatest miracle of the Book of Kells is its survival through 1,200 often turbulent years. Today, little remains of the Monastery of Kells. The great shrine of Columba is now wedged forlornly between a bungalow and a police station outside a churchyard where among the tombs the great high crosses still stand under a round tower. On Iona, the great Benedictine abbey which had replaced the modest monastery of Columba itself fell to ruins. Only to be restored again at the hands of the Iona community founded by George MacLeod working with unemployed tradesmen during the years of the Depression in the 1930s. The spirit of the Iona community sought reconciliation between the churches. And in 1958, a remarkable symbol of this was placed in the restored cloisters. Here, at the spiritual center of this little island, where the first poem to the Virgin in the Western world was written, a sculpture was placed in her memory by the artist Jacques Lipschitz, calling his sculpture Between Heaven and Earth. I took my biblical name, uh, Jacob Lipschitz, Jew, Jew uh, faithful to the religion of his ancestors, has made this virgin for the better understanding of human beings on this earth so that the spirit may prevail. Columba climbed a small hill overlooking the monastery and stood on its summit for a little while saying, on this place, small and mean though it be, not only the kings of the Irish with their peoples, but also the rulers of barbarous and foreign nations with their subjects, will bestow great and a special honor. Also, a special reverence will be bestowed by saints even of other churches. <laughs> 